Welcome to Salon Talks. I am Mary Elizabeth Williams, and this is Wendy Holden. She is a journalist and the best-selling author of several novels with titles that I really love, like As You Like It and A View to a Kilt. But now she has released the final book in her trilogy on the, quote, disruptive women of the House of Windsor. Following on the, ha on the heels of the governess and the duchess, we have arrived at last at the princess. Hi, how are you? I'm very well, Mary Elizabeth. Thank you. It's really exciting to be here. Thank you for having me on. Oh, it's a it's a pleasure. Now, I will admit that I know a lot about this family. I'm a little bit obsessed with them, but I want you to imagine for a moment that I am someone who has never heard of Princess Diana. And I want you to tell me about the heroine of your novel, this fun-loving, romantic, slightly rebellious teenage girl named Diana Spencer? That's a great question, because, uh, and no one's asked me that, but that, that really puts us right in the middle of, of, of what's going on. This is a story of two opposing forces. This is a story of a, the, a, a, the palace machine, the Buckingham Palace royal machine, which wanted to find a bride for Prince Charles, who was 30, and in the eyes of his family needed to get married. So there was a very pragmatic, very hard-headed, very unsentimental search for a bride. And the person they hit on, the, the sole candidate, more or less, was this girl, Diana Spencer, who was young, very aristocratic, but completely in love with love, completely idealistic, completely romantic, uh, a massive fan of romantic novels, which I think had probably formed her entire world view. And they were completely opposing forces. And it was the combination of these two forces that brought about the 1981 Royal Wedding. So this is um, the contrast I, I wanted to explore in my novel. And um, I wanted to look at Diana's background because even though she's the most famous, one of the most famous women who ever lived, her background and how she actually got to be the Princess of Wales is, is quite um, unknown, it's quite obscure. And it's a very complicated story and a very interesting story that tells us a lot about um, the 1980s, a lot about the British class system and um, a lot about Diana herself. Uh, so I, those, all those themes came together in, in, in The Princess. But she, most of all, is a really warm-hearted, really funny, really clever, really compelling heroine and he was sort of doubly betrayed in a way so it's a sad story as well as a, a funny and happy story you know she had a very sad childhood her parents were spectacularly and acrimoniously divorced and she fell um, in love with Prince Charles as she thought was going to rescue her from from all that and, and 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 take her into a realm of bliss and then she was betrayed on that front too but in between there was there was happiness, there was joy. You know, she had a, a wonderful time living in London with her slowly flatmates, and I particularly wanted to get across all the fun that they had there. Um, and uh, just a young girl, you know, full of hope and 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 full of fun. So um, she was she was a great heroine, one of one of the most interesting women I've ever written about. So I, I really enjoyed it, and I came to really love her. And I was sad uh, when it was all over and, and the book was finished. This, you know, you have to go back and remember, this is a teenager we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, absolutely. This is, a, this is a teenage girl. This is a, a love struck, very, very sheltered, very protected girl. And what you explore in this book, which I think is, is really interesting, even for those of us who know a bit about the back channel, who know a bit about that, those, as you say, opposing forces, you explore that in even more depth about the real strategizing that went yeah. on and there's a particular character who I found very interesting in this story Stephen Barry I want yeah. you to tell me a little bit about him and his story and his role in really changing the course of history yeah yes yeah, Stephen Barry is was um the valet to Prince Charles he was his manservant um but more than that he was his fixer and he used to um, specifically um, deal with um, Prince Charles's love life and his girlfriends. And so it, when Prince Charles got a new girlfriend, Stephen Barry would take charge of the 
of, of the affair. He would tell the girl where to park when she came to Buckingham Palace. He'd tell her which door to go through, which room to go through. He would organise the dinners. He'd organise the candles, the food, everything. So he was he really ran the prince's love life for him. And I discovered this when I found, a, it was sort of at the bottom of a pile of books in the market store, um, the 1980s bio, autobiography of Stephen Barry. And I quickly realised it was a complete gold mine for, for, for all sorts of detail, but specifically that. And the story of the, in The Princess, I wanted to bring together all the different elements that, as you say, um, really manipulated this, this wedding into being. And there were so many different, different people involved and, and, and Stephen Barry was one of them. But I, I, and the Queen Mother was another, and another was, was the British press. And I, I wanted all these people to have a voice. But Stephen Barry was completely crucial because he was the, the palace, he, he was the machinery. You know, the Queen Mother star spotted Diana, identified her as, as the girl. But it, it, somebody in the palace had to be on hand to, to make it all happen and take charge of, 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 the, of, the, of the affair of the, and, and get the whole thing on the rails. And my take on Stephen Barry, um, I wanted him to be a sort of funny character. Uh, I mean, he's, he's slightly sinister, but he's also quite funny. And so I particularly imagined him deciding to help her, deciding that this girl was going to be the one. Um, and so there were lots of, as you were saying, because Diana was so young and Charles was so much older and the environment she was entering in, in the royal family um, was just full of people who were so much older uh, so much tradition, so much sort of Victorian hangover. You know, it was completely unlike her and the kind of life she'd been having in the flat and so on. Um, so I, I, I visualized, I, I imagined, I fictionalized um, Stephen Barry giving giving Diana advice um, to help her bridge this gap between herself and her uh, husband to be, um, just to get the affair to to to, to run more, more smoothly. And so he would give her advice on what to do on board the Royal Yacht Britannia, how to behave at Balmoral. But one of my um, most fun things, the thing I really enjoyed imagining was him explaining to Diana, young Diana, the teenage girl, why Prince Charles was so obsessed with this completely old fashioned um, comedy series called The Goon Show, which wasn't even sort of, you couldn't even hear it at the time. You know, you'd be on the radio in the 1950s and Prince Charles was completely obsessed with it. But Diana um, would never have heard of it. She wouldn't have had the faintest idea what he was talking about. And so I had to explain who, who all the characters were. So yeah, he was a he was a sort of funny character, slightly sinister character, but he was the fixer, Prince Charles' manservant, a kind of buttons to her Cinderella, but with a slightly sort of um, you know, worldly, slightly um sinister twist. The the fixer. I I like that. And you know, when you talk you you use that word, the affair between them, and yet of course. One of the things that you take on in this book that I think was interesting and yet often goes unspoken because it's so sensitive is that she had to be a virgin. Completely. It was, and this is, it's so fascinating because we imagine the 1980s, because I suppose the music is still very much around in fashion, that the 1980s seems much closer to us than it actually is. And in terms of, of, of social conventions, it's, it's so far in the past. And so now, if you were marrying a, a royal prince, you wouldn't have to be a virgin. But in 1980, the same um, conventions applied as would have applied 100 years before. So this is why it was so difficult to find the right girl. You know, she, she had to be young, so she could have lots of children. She had to be Protestant. She had to be a front rank aristocrat. She couldn't be any old person. And she had to be a virgin. She had to be untouched and undefiled and pure and innocent. Prince Charles, of course, and this is complete double standards. Prince Charles, of course, had had loads of girlfriends and, and these standards didn't apply to him at all. But nobody thought there was anything wrong with that at the time. It was all um, you know, completely normal. So absolutely, yeah, she 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 had to be a virgin. And um at the, even at the time, a uh, doubt was cast on whether this is actually the case with Diana. How could she have been? How could she, this young, pretty girl living in London with her friends, always being visited by all these eligible young men? How could it be the case? But it was one of my th themes in the book and, and my, my, my theory is that her um, exhaustive reading of um, romantic novels made that um, co a completely normal situation for her. She'd read so many novels in which um, 
the young, innocent heroine was swept off her feet by the worldly, dashing duke or whoever it was. And chastity was always rewarded with true love. This was always a theme of these novels. So she would have taken the sin over hundreds and hundreds of these books. And so, and she said herself that she was keeping herself pure. She was keeping herself for tidy. the right man. <laughs> I, I always yeah, love exactly. that word was tidy. <laughs> tidy, keeping herself tidy, exactly. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, she completely was. She completely was, and she completely did. And and yeah, so it's it's amazing, isn't it? How, how that could have been seen as as uh, as as completely you know normal in, in, right. in that and, sort of context. And yet, you also portray her as a woman who is. She is a nineteen year old. She does have desires. She is sure. yeah. a young woman. She's you know she's not cold. She's not. She's not, not at all. Not at all. She was absolutely crazily in love with Prince Charles, or the idea of Prince Charles. And what she thought he was, she was completely convinced he was the absolute embodiment of the romantic hero and life with, with him was going to be bliss. And of course, one of the reasons for that was that she'd had this really sad childhood with um, the acrimonious divorce of her parents, which which had had such a terrible effect on the family because her parents had split in, at a time when that wasn't really normal at all and they'd lived the, the, the siblings had lived with her father and and seen her mother only occasionally and so in the, the, the diana of the book and possibly the diana of real life it constructed for herself this alternative reality in which love was valued and 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 rewarded and everybody was happy so as a complete contrast to her, to her um, as a way of coping with what had happened to her. And Charles fitted into this and he was going to take her away from all the misery of the past. Right. And an intact family is, is of primary importance. And the way that we as the reader come into this character, this fictional Diana, is through a fictional friend of hers who yes. she confides in, who she is a schoolmate of, and who she then has this sort of pivotal recurring moment uh, later on in her marriage, near the end of her marriage. I want to know who, how you created her, how you, did you draw upon memories of, of other friends of Diana's? Were you looking at people who have spoken out about her, who knew her when she was a young woman? Yes, a bit of that. Uh, I, I found various um, bits and pieces of memoir from her school days and, 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 and thought about um, had, had, had how a friend would possibly work. But the real way, the, the, the sort of main motivation for it, the main inspiration was um, Nancy Mitford's Pursuit of Love when um, Fanny um, goes to stay with the Radlett family. And the Radlett family is, as you know, these are sort of crazy aristocratic family who do all these bonkers things. And Fanny's very sensible and she's quite shocked, but really it's completely bowled over by these people. And I just imagined that, that when you were a little girl, that's very possibly how the Spencer family might have appeared to someone um, like Sandy. So I wanted to have this sort of um, relationship between them when she goes to visit the family and we encounter the Spencers to start with as quite colourful, very aristocratic, slightly eccentric. But then the picture darkens and you realise all the pain that's behind it, all the difficulty, all these awful misogynistic attitudes and the, the way that her mother had been treated and, and all the toxic relatives such as her grandmother and um and so the picture slightly darkens so that was really where she came from but I also wanted Sandy to represent um modern life a modern girl because Sandy is somebody who's she's she's a clever girl but she's also got ambition she wants to do work she wants to have a job she wants to have a career so she's a contrast to Diana who's still very much in this sort of we did this romantic mindset but also never really been encouraged to ex fulfill her potential in that way and Sandy tells Diana at various junctions through, through the novel you know you, you could do so much more you know you could work she tries to encourage her at one stage to work in in nursing because she obviously has fantastic empathy with the patients that the, that the school goes to visit you know, the patients at the local um, uh, mental health facility where Diana is the only pupil who knows how to deal with them how to approach them and which is a true, which which came from a real incidents, and pointed up the fact that you know all the things that she later became so famous for as Princess of Wales, her her empathy, her complete, um, she could cope with anybody. She knew exactly what to say, how to make everybody feel good, had no fear, 
um, that was there right from the beginning. All the things, all, all her uh, her most famous um, characteristics. So that was really that was what Sandy's role as well. You know, she she frames the story for us, but she also presents a few contrasts and makes us realise you know how how different Diana was um, from from what would have been a modern girl at the time. And which puts her, uh, as you have positioned this trilogy that you've written, um, as a disruptor, right? So yeah, I want to ask you a little, bit, a, little, yeah, a little bit about these two other women who you've written about, who also, yeah. who also shook up the Windsors in the nineteenth, sure. in, in the twentieth yeah. century. Yes. Um, you know, these yeah. other yeah. women who came from outside the inner circle, yes, um, yes. and who challenged yes. it in their own ways. Absolutely. Yes, well, the, fir the first in, in my series is called The Governess, The, the Royal Governess, and it's about um, Marion Crawford, who is a, a Scottish teacher, a young Scottish teacher who um, taught Queen Elizabeth as a little girl. And I found this, her autobiography, a very old, battered, sort of discontinued book in a, in a, in a bookshop in, in the north of England one day. Um, and I opened it, uh, and the very first paragraph said something like, um, I didn't mean to work for the royal family. I wanted to work with poor children in the slums of Edinburgh. And I was completely, well, that's, that, this is a story. How did somebody with those ambitions end up working for the royal family for you know nearly 20 years? So I dived into the story. It quickly became obvious. It was an amazing, amazing tale. And it had been buried for nearly 80 years because what happened with Marion Crawford was that she'd spent, she spent 20 years with them and they happened to be the 20 most tumultuous years of the 20th century, the abdication followed by World War II. And she was with the, with the Windsors all this time and she, she experienced it as, as they did. And she, was, she, she tried to leave a couple of times but they always wheeled her back in. But she eventually left, retired and wrote a book um, about the family and her work with, with, with the family. And it was very admiring, very, very sympathetic. It was a lovely book. And... Um, they were furious and they cut her off completely brutally and forever. And she was, they never saw her again. And it was so sad because it, it had been such a happy story. She's completely devoted to them, particularly to the, the queen, little princess Elizabeth. So it was a really fascinating story. And that was the first one. Um, and I hadn't particularly intended to take it any further, but during the writing of the governess, um, the, Wallace Simpson had appeared in a scene uh, at Balmoral. That it, that they'd encountered each other in the woods at Balmoral. And Wallace had come up on a visit because King Edward VIII had um, asked her to come up and stay in, it, in, in Scottish Castle. And when I, 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 when I started to write Wallace and to think about it, I started to wonder if everything we think we know about her, at least here in Britain, where everyone is led to believe that she was basically, you know, the, the most wicked woman who ever lived, whether that was actually the case and what had actually happened and how had she captured the heart of this, in the world's most eligible bachelor and, and why? You know, and so when I started to look into that, I uncovered another amazing story and, and, and it was, I, I novelised her journey from, the obscurity in, in Baltimore to you know the the, the the British throne almost. So um and then I had two books about royal disruptors and then naturally there was Diana, as you say, the ultimate royal disruptor, and a disruptor on such a scale that the consequences of, of her uh, involvement with the royal family are, are still playing out. I mean, they're still here. There's still every day another story about Prince Harry, Meghan Markle, Prince William, Prince Charles, the great schisms. So it just goes on and on and on, like ripples in a pool. So um, yeah, they're, 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 I see them as a as a as three three very interesting women who co completely changed the institution um, and revealed a lot about it um, in, in the in, in in the course of their careers with them. Well, that's my question is, is now we have this this new American divorcee who is a royal yes. disruptor. Um, you know, I wonder where you see Megan in this lineage, Diana's daughter-in-law, who she never got to know. Where sure. does she fit yeah. in, this, in this story that it, it keeps these repeating stories about loyalty, about yes. expectations, yeah. about families, about class yeah. and about love? Yeah, yeah. yes. 
Well, I think Megan, it, it could be really interesting, but I think I think um, she's too we're too close to the story at the moment. We're too close to what's what's been. It's, it's quite hard to see it in context and in time. The thing about Diana is that it's twenty five years now since she died, and she is a, a, a proper historical figure. You know, she belongs to a, a proper historical epoch, which is now being studied. You know, people study the nineteen eighties in school now. It's it's history. And she's part of it. Megan is not. I mean, she's she's too. She may well be one day, but she's too. She's too close. It's too. It's too close to see. And and we can't really see what's going to happen next and how the whole thing's going to going to play out. Diana's is an entire arc from start to finish, um, and obviously it ended very tragically and spectacularly. But we have an entire life there, um, just as we have with Wallace and just as we have with, with Marion Crawford. So she's not really part of a. a, a my sort of um, she's not really another winter disruptor in, in a novel sense for me yet but she may well be one day so no, yeah one and day. it is completely fascinating yeah one day yeah maybe yeah maybe one day we, it's, we, it's, if, we all, if we all live if we all live long enough Wendy well I want to ask you one more thing about that because you you do write historical novels you it, it's scary to me that the 80s is history too at this point but you know the thing that I think is so fascinating about Diana is she is still very much in the present you know the the Duchess of York was recently saying I can picture us being grannies together chasing around our grandchildren yeah. you know we still you know the William and Harry still talk about if she was here sure. she would be doing yeah. this yeah. if she was here yeah. she would be doing yes. that and I wonder when you were thinking about her writing this book were you thinking about what your Diana the Diana that you came to know would be like now in this post-Elizabeth world where Charles is on the throne where her ex-husband yeah. is on the throne yeah do you, do you think about that Diana yes it's it's it, it's really hard to say isn't it because Diana, she, I think it would depend who she was with, if who she was married to, what her situation was as to whether she was happy or not, because that obviously if she was happy and settled, that would have a huge effect on, on, on how she behaved and how she saw the world. Um, but in terms of uh, her effect, her enduring effect, it's, it's obvious to me from the amount of things that I've read and seen and, 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 and watched that, um, there was something so special about her, which has not ever really been replicated. And it's something to do with this incredible connection with people, which I don't think any other member of the royal family, possibly the Queen Mother when she was young, but not really anybody else, has ever really had that impact. And it was to do with um, people, the British people, people all over the world felt that they, she understood them. She was like a sort of friend in high places, that, that she, they... they I completely saw her as someone who understood them and they understood her because she'd suffered and, and she knew what it was like. And she, 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 there was just always this instinctive connection. And I think that's what endures and why she she remains as, as, a, as a presence. I don't think that's the case with, with anybody else, certainly not with the present um, royal family. So uh, you know, she's a kind of, it's like a sort of wattage from a fading star, you know, it's like something that, so she's gone, but she's like one of those stars that it still shines you know, because it's um, it was so different, so dramatic. Um, so yeah, maybe that's the reason. But if if she'd still if she was still around, uh, yeah, I don't know. Would would would? And I'm not sure whether things would be better or worse, really, because obviously she, she had great capacity for disrupting. She was quite naughty, and what what she would you know maybe she'd be really happy that Charles and Camilla were now king and queen, or or maybe she wouldn't. <laughs> It's really hard to say. <laughs> well, I love that. Um, I love that metaphor of the the light from a from a a dying star. That's a beautiful yeah. way of putting it. She's still she's still shining on us, and and we see it in this in this really lovely, sad, funny book that that imagines the the young princess before she was the princess when she was just Diana. Thank you so much for talking to me today. What a pleasure. The book once no, again is called you, Mary Elizabeth. Princess and it's an absolute joy to read. Um congratulations Wendy. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me on. It's been wonderful to talk to you.